Hello, my name is Jim Van Kosky. I'm the curator of the Sports Legends of Delaware County Museum. And today we're going to be talking about the Mickey Vernon Gallery at the Sports Legends of Delaware County Museum. We named our baseball gallery the Mickey Vernon slash Danny Mertzall Gallery because these two gentlemen have been such a significant impact on baseball in Delaware County. And Mickey Vernon, as a matter of fact, would be known as the greatest player that Delaware County ever produced. And I guess you would say because Danny Murtaugh won two World Series that he would be uh, the best manager that Delaware County ever produced. So Mickey Vernon was born in Marcus Hook, most southernmost municipality in Delaware County on the Delaware River. Uh, but he went to high school at Eddystone. Marcus Hook did not have a high school at the time. And he is a 1936 graduate of Eddy Stone High School. And we're going to be talking about his, really, his 50 years in professional baseball. Starting uh, the year after he graduated from high school, he took a baseball scholarship to Villanova. In 1937, he was playing for Villanova. Uh, and he signed the summer of 1937, that's the only year he spent in Villanova, and he signed with uh, St. Louis Browns. Now Mickey is most notably a Washington Senator, Washington National, but he did originally sign with the St. Louis Browns in 1937. In 1939, he made it to the major leagues. His first game in the major leagues was July 8th, 1939, which those that know anything at all about uh, sports history would know that that's four days after Lou Gehrig gave his great luckiest man on the face of the earth speech. And Mickey always says that he was so disappointed that he was not called up four days earlier simply because the Yankees, who Lou Gehrig played for, the Yankees were uh, playing the Washington senators that day and he said when he got called up four days later the Washington senators were still talking about what a, what a great moment in history it was and if you're going to talk about speeches you have the Martin Luther King speech you have the Gettysburg Address and usually uh, historians will say this Lou Gehrig speech is, is right up there with one of the greatest speeches in the history of the United States so you have 1939, Mickey makes it to the major leagues. <coughs> uh, he was called up from the uh, Eastern League teams, Springfield. But in 1940, they decided to send him down. He did not stay in the major leagues in 1940, although he was called up at the end of the year. And in 1940, he was um, playing for Jersey City in the International League. It's not unusual for some very, very fine baseball players to be brought up and then get sent down. Uh, for example, Mickey Mantle would be one of those. Brought up to the major leagues, uh, found him wanting, thought he needed a little more seasoning, got sent back down. A modern day player where the same thing happened would be uh, Mike Trout. The, Cal or the Angels, Los Angeles Angels brought him up, Kept him up for maybe a, a month and a half, decided that perhaps he needed a little more seasoning. They sent him back down. So Mickey went back to the minor leagues in Jersey City, but then he was recalled in 1941. In 1941, he was in the majors to stay, never to spend another day in the minor leagues. And in 1941, he came so close. The number 300 is a very important number in baseball because if you bat 300, you're considered to be a, a very fine batter. As a matter of fact, if you have a lifetime batting average of 300, uh, the chances are pretty good you might end up in the Hall of Fame. Now, Mickey was, had a batting average of 299 the last day of the season. And the third baseman for the New York Yankees, and that's who they were playing, told Mickey, he said, you know, Mickey, you get one more hit today, and you'll have a batting average of 300. You'd like to hit 300, wouldn't you? And Mickey said, of course, who wouldn't want to hit 300? So he said, I'll tell you what, when you come to bat, 
I'll be at third base and I'll be on my heels. In other words, what he's telling is, Mickey, that he's going to give him a gift hit. So if you lay one down the third base, I'm not going to charge. I'll stay back. And that might give you a chance to have a 300 batting average. So Mickey get us, gets up to bat, and, and he says that it was a bunting situation. He, he had no problem trying to bunt for a base hit. So he bunts for a base hit. On his way down to first base, he happens to see the third baseman uh, doing exactly what he said he was going to do, laying back on his heels. But the catcher wasn't in on the play. The catcher, Bill Dickey, ran out, grabbed the ball, threw the first. Hence, Mickey didn't get his 300 batting average. So that's a story that Mickey would always like to tell, and it's an amusing one where you have a situation where even major league players, when they had games that didn't mean that much, were willing to help one another. So I imagine that still goes on today. I don't know how frequently, but it's something in Mickey's experience. So Mickey in 1941 had a real nice year, but it ended up batting 299. He uh, played in 1942. 1943, and then at the end of 1943, we all know what was going on in the United States and in the world. You had World War II, and Mickey was drafted, went into the Navy. At the end of 1943, all of 1944, and all of 1945, Mickey served in the military. Like so many professional athletes, baseball was the primary professional sport at the time, so you had hundreds and hundreds of players, thousands if you include the minor leaguers, serving the, during World War II in the United States. So Mickey, uh, actually he served in an island called Ulithi in the Pacific Ocean. He was there about nine months. Uh, we had um, a card set, and you'll, you'll, you're seeing those cards on the screen now, I believe. And this card set was meant to be a tribute set to uh, Mickey Vernon and the life and times in baseball. And it was made and produced about two months before Mickey passed away. And it turned into a memorial card set when Mickey passed away. But Mickey did proofread. On the back of each card is a text telling you a little bit about the photograph on the card. And Mickey proofread each and every card. And uh, he was actually able to pick up a couple mistakes. And this was at the age of 90. Mickey lived till he was 90 years of age. So here he is doing a proofread for this card set at the age of 90. And uh, he did pick up a mistake or two. And one of the mistakes was the amount of time that he spent in Ulithi. We had him down originally spending being there three months. He said, no, no, Jim. He said, I was, I was on that island for um, nine months. And one of the individuals that he served with was Larry Doby. Larry Doby happened to be the first African-American to play baseball in the American League two months after Jackie Robinson achieved that notoriety in the National League. So uh, it was a positive experience being in the service, Mickey said. And then when he was uh, back in baseball in 1946, it didn't seem like it hurt him that much. Because in 1946, Mickey happened to win the batting title. And there's an image on the screen at some point in time you're looking at. The people that he defeated was Ted Williams, the remarkable Ted Williams, and Dominic DiMaggio. Both of those individuals played for the Boston Red Sox. So here you are. People would say, Mickey, I, I can't believe that you were able to win the batting title defeating Ted Williams. And Mickey would say, as humble as he was, says, I, I couldn't believe it myself. Here I am <laughs> coming back, defeating the, the great Ted Williams, who is, many people arguably will say, certainly one of the top hitters of all time in baseball. So that's an interesting story regarding Mickey. And in 1946, they used to have what is called barnstorming, where in this example, Bob Feller picked an all-star team from the major leagues. And since Mickey won the batting title, Mickey was on that team. And then they would barnstorm, which meant that they would go from city to city after the major league season, and they would play other all-star teams. 
And in the year 1946, the other All-Star team that they were playing was called the Satchel Page All-Stars, the incomparable Satchel Page. So Bob Feller, pitcher, Satchel Page, a pitcher, for over 20 games, they went to 20 different cities, and they would each pitch the first three innings of each of those games. So Mickey had a chance to bat against the great Satchel Page, you know, at least 20 times, because uh, during that time period, and Satchel Page is quoted as saying that for some remarkable reason, he was not able to get Mickey out. He said, Mickey owned me, and for, for one of those reasons, I just can't figure out, but if the bases were loaded and my team was up by two runs and Mickey Vernon was up, I'd as soon walk him because that's only giving up one run rather than the two that, that would come in on the base hit. So Mickey and Satchel had a real good relationship. And in 19, eventually, Satchel Page did make it to the major leagues. And they were actually, I believe, teammates on Cleveland one year. So that's 1946. And then Mickey continued to play in the major leagues. He played for 14, 15 years for the Washington Nationals. And then in 1953, he won a second batting title. In 1953, he defeated uh, Al Rosen for the batting title. Al Rosen was the leader in home runs. He was the leader in RBIs and he missed the batting title by one point. There's something in baseball called the triple crown. I mean, if you're a hitter and you win the triple crown, you are uh, probably gonna be the most valuable player that year. Very difficult to lead the league in home runs, batting average, and RBIs. So Al Rosen got beat by one point. And, and Al Rosen and Mickey were very good friends. Uh, Rich Westcott's book, Al Rosen, uh, wrote the foreword on to that book and his last sentence was Mickey you know if he only would have didn't get a base hit your last time up I would have won the triple crown so I imagine that every time they were together at banquets that Al Rosen would constantly be mentioning mentioning that so that picture that you're seeing on the screen is with Al Rosen Mickey Vernon and Ty Cobb Ty Cobb uh, has the highest lifetime batting average of anybody that's ever played Major League Baseball, 367, and Mickey Vernon's uh, showing Ty Cobb that he just inched out Al Rosen for the batting title that year. An interesting story about Ty Cobb is that uh, a historian was giving a talk on Ty Cobb, and there was a question afterwards, and they said, well, if Ty Cobb was playing today, what do you think he would be hitting? So the person, the historian said, well, he'd probably be hitting about the same as what you're hitting today, 301, 310, you know, 315 perhaps. And then the gentleman says, well, you just got through saying how, what a great hitter Ty Cobb was. How, why are you saying that he wouldn't be any better than the hitters today? And the writer of the, and the publisher of the, of, the, of the book said, well, I mean, you got to remember Ty Cobb, 67 years old today. So it would be a little more difficult for him to, to get down to first base. So these three gentlemen are uh, three individuals that were great baseball players, and, and Mickey, again, winning his second batting title, defeating Al Rosen. Now, when you win a batting championship, uh, the Louisville Slugger Company started giving you a silver bat, and they continue that today. Now, one of the images on the screen shows Dwight Eisenhower presenting Mickey with his silver bat. Now, this picture was taken in 1960, uh, 1964, the year after, 1954, the year after Mickey won the batting title. And it's the only time a president ever gave this silver bat to a player. So Mickey's daughter is a uh, still has this silver bat to this day. It's one of her most treasured items and Mickey uh, the, his first batting title I asked him I said did you get a silver bat uh, when you won the first batting title in 1946 he said no they weren't giving silver bats then what I got was the five hundred dollars he said I no longer have the five hundred dollars but I still do have the silver bat so I'm, I'm thankful that the Louisville Slugger started doing that at that time very very impressive 
picture, and as I said before, Mickey Vernon was Dwight Eisenhower's favorite player. Dwight Eisenhower would go to a number of games, and Mickey Vernon would be in at Washington. Mickey Vernon probably knew more presidents than, than any other player. I mean, he played in front of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, played in front of Harry Truman, played in front of Dwight Eisenhower. He was played in front of uh, or managed when John F. Kennedy was president. And uh, Lyndon Johnson would also come to those games at the same time. So here you have an individual that sort of like uh, knew the, the, Republic, the, the realm of politics. Even uh, Richard Nixon, was, he was considered a friend. Mickey said that he, went to, he was at a game when he was scouting for the Yankees, and Nixon was at the game, and Nixon had a Secret Service gentleman next to him, and he asked the Secret Service gentleman to get up and waved over to Mickey to come and sit next to him. He said, so that's how much uh, Mickey was respected by these various political leaders in Washington. As a matter of fact, he was said to be, the, the, so many people say, Mickey Vernon was the nicest person I ever met. When his statue was erected in Marcus Hook in 2003, Bob Feller wrote a letter and said, if you didn't like Mickey Vernon, you didn't like anybody. And anybody that ever met Mickey Vernon, the man, would agree the same thing. He, he was the nicest person you ever met. He would do things for people that would never hit the newspapers, but everybody knew that when he was, he was a hero when they were kids, and then when they became adults, Mickey still was their hero. So that's Dwight Eisenhower and Mickey Vernon. Uh, Mickey Vernon still has records. And there's an image on the screen. At some point in time, you'll be seeing it. You'll see uh, Mickey Vernon sliding across home plate with the great Minnie Minoso being the offensive player, which is a very unusual play. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen one other than this photograph where the first baseman is tagging a base runner out crossing home plate. And the story behind this is that Minnie Minoso was on second base. Mickey's playing first base. And Mickey's in the game as always, and he notices that Minnie Minoso is going to be a steal third base. So at the same time, Minnie Minoso is still in third base, it's a wild pitch. So now you have Minnie Minoso stealing third. Mickey says, I know that guy, he's going to try to take home because the ball's up against the backstop. So Mickey darts in from first base grabs the ball. This photograph doesn't, does, it doesn't seem that way, but uh, Mickey makes the tag at Minnie Minoso at home plate. So Mickey was uh, very proud of that play. He was an excellent defensive player. As a matter of fact, he still has the records for participating in the most double plays as an infielder. So this is his last year playing in the majors was 1960. So here we are 40, 60 years later, and he still owns that record as participating in the most level plays. Uh, I think a lot of times when the Hall of Fame voters vote, uh, they discount defensive play, especially if you're uh, not a middle infielder. But Mickey was known as a superb defensive player. As a matter of fact, I asked him uh, what were the best compliments anybody ever gave you, and he mentioned that one of the compliments that he really liked was that a sports writer said that he could play first base in a tuxedo and never get it wrinkled and never miss a play. So he, he, he kind of liked that compliment as, as a defensive player. So that shot is uh, one of the images that we have in this Mickey Vernon card set that was produced in 2008. Now, in, in 1955, I believe it was, uh, there was a musical called Damn Yankees. And Mickey said that later on, when he would go to New York, he, he would like to go to musicals. So he went to the musical with his manager, Chuck Dressen, and they were invited backstage. And the image that, that you see is Gwen Verdon, who was the star of, she played Lola in the movie Damn Yankees. And there's Mickey looking at Gwen Verdon and Chuck Dressen as well. 
And it's something that uh, we recreated when I was a teacher at Strathaven High School. John Shankwater decided that since Mickey lived in the neighborhood, they were going to do the musical Damn Yankees and have Mickey as a special guest. And we emulated this scene right here with a couple of the uh, actors from the Strathaven High School musical of Damn Yankees. So there's a lot of memories in these card sets for a lot of different people, myself included. Uh, Mickey Vernon played about 14 years for, for Washington. He played two years for the Cleveland Indians. He played two years, excuse me, he played two years for the Boston Red Sox, one year for the Milwaukee Braves, and one year for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He was a player coach for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And that year happened to be 1960. And in 1960, when they won the World Series, you see an image of them celebrating that. Mickey is uh, pouring some champagne. Mickey's pouring some champagne for Danny Murtaugh. And that's a, that's a story in itself. You have Mickey Vernon and Danny Myrtle. I mean, if you go back to the early 1930s, they were teammates on the same American Legion team in Chester. So here they are. They made a promise to one another. At that time, Mickey said that they promised one another, if one became a manager, that the other one would ask that person to be the coach. So here you are, Mickey and Danny Myrtle together again, 1960, celebrating the Pittsburgh Pirates defeating the New York Yankees for the World Championship. And Mickey cherished that ring, and, he, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that you really want to get. A lot of times, uh, players, they just want to play on a World Championship team just to get that ring. So here's 1960 is the case where you have Danny Myrtle and Mickey Vernon, teammates in American Legion, celebrating. So 1960 represents Mickey's final year in the major leagues, but he was asked to manage the, the Washington Senators. So here we have a, an image, if we're seeing it, of John F. Kennedy throwing out the first ball and Mickey being the manager looking at that. So Mick, Mickey uh, was such a beloved player in Washington that they'd asked him to be a, a manager as well. This number three jersey is the number that he wore when he won the 1946 batting championship and the number that he wore when he won the 1953 championship. The jersey I'm wearing on April 14th, 2005, Mickey was one of the former Washington Senator players invited to take the field prior to the inaugural opening home game between the new Washington Nationals, which came from Montreal, and the Arizona Diamondbacks. So this is, this is the jersey that Mickey actually wore that day. So it's a, we do have at our museum, 301 Ivan Avenue, Wayne, Pennsylvania, a number of items worn by Mickey. We actually have a Dodger jersey there that Mickey wore in 1975, compliments of Brad now when he was the hitting coach for the Los Angeles Dodgers. So Mickey was in baseball for 50 years, uh, two and a half years as a manager. He was so beloved that his hometown, his home county, Delaware County, decided that they were going to build a statue in his honor. And this was uh, the year 2003. The cost of the statue, they collected $50,000 at that time in about two months. I mean, people were making contributions from all over the United States that met Mickey and they wanted to do something for him. Uh, former major league players, former captains of business. So Mickey's will forever be remembered because as my wife would like to say, you exist as long as you're remembered by that statue in, in Marcus Hook on Market Street and I, I do recommend that if you ever get a chance to visit that statue, please do so, because it's a tremendous likeness of him. 
And it's interesting to note that the most southernmost point in Delaware County, Marcus Hook, has a statue commemorating the life and times of Mickey Vernon. And here we are in Radnor, which is the most northernmost point, where we have a statue of Emlyn Sinnell at our museum commemorating the life and times of Emlyn Sinnell. And when we erected that statue in honor of Emlyn Sinnell, and when we did the research on his life, you couldn't help but look at the similarities between Mickey and Emlyn Sinnell as athletes, as people that served their country in the military, and as just people that you, you couldn't find anybody that would say anything negative. Just like Emlyn Tennell, all the, all the interviews we did, you never found anybody say anything negative about Emlyn. And Mickey Vernon, same thing. Never found anybody say anything negative about Emlyn Tennell. So I'm going to sign off at this point in time. I'm going to encourage you to visit 301 Ivan Avenue in Wayne, Pennsylvania, Sports Legends of Delaware County. You must come and take a look at our memorabilia that we have that once belonged to Mickey and the other six galleries that exist. So we have seven galleries in our museum, one of which is the Mickey Vernon, Danny Murtaugh Baseball Gallery, sponsored, I must say, by Steve Berman. And signing off, it's Jim Van Kosky, curator, Sports Legends of Delaware County Museum, Wayne, Pennsylvania, Radnor Township.